you're talking about in terms of narrative shifting, if we're talking about, you know, the war on drugs, if we're talking about this idea of rape culture and, and how it is that we embrace rape culture. And let's just talk about bl black men. Let's talk about black men here at, at Morehouse College, how there is a rape culture that's here that we don't talk about. What and how is that connected to the consequence of black lives? How does how does that how do we connect the dots there? Right, to say that black lives matter. But what this generation did that distinguished it from the civil rights movement is they said all black lives matter. Now that's something very different than this moment when you have Claudette Colvin. Does anyone know who Claudette Colvin is in the room? So you would know if you do know who she is, that she would have and should have been Rosa Parks, right? that she um, took that same kind of public stand against segregation almost a year, maybe two years before Rosa Parks did. But because she was a single mother, because she was dark skinned, um, because she had a really strong Southern accent, um, the movement decided not to represent her, right? Now, we talked a little bit about the kind of interventions that I think that hip hop has made aesthetically, right? right yes. So that we no longer are, for a while there, <laughs> we're kind of back to it with Drake and Obama, mm, yeah. but for a while there, we had a real spectrum of what we considered to be beautiful in blackness. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously the 70s soul music and hip hop continued that. Um, but to have someone like Mike Brown, right? Um, who would have been the, basically the Claudette Colvin in this story, right? Okay. I mean, even when the video, this is what I thought was really important. I thought that when that video leaked of Mike Brown mushing this guy, remember that video that they released when he was in the store? They said he'd stolen the blunt and mushed the store owner. In another time, that kind of video would have shut down the movement, mm -hmm. would have shut down the demands that people in St. Louis and Ferguson were making for accountability and for justice, right? Mm -hmm. They would have said, oh, we were out here in these streets riding for Mike Brown, but now we see that he's a thug, so let's go home. Like, we were wrong. He deserved whatever he got. And this generation said, no, these respectability politics are a thing of the past. We don't care if he was not a perfect person, if he d wasn't the perfect victim. We're still gonna advocate for justice on behalf of them. Now where we have like lacked is being able to say, well, this applies also to women, to trans women. Like we haven't rose up in the streets in the same way that we rose up for our brothers. That remains like our struggle to, like something that we have to transform is our, our like, the way that we are stuck in a patriarchal paradigm. Um, so, so let's, can we use that as kind of a little bit of a segue into the first, the first video? video? Yeah. yeah let's, let's look at that real so quick. So in terms of narrative shifting, real quickly, um, I, I brought four different examples. I'm also a filmmaker. Um, and I have a feature length film that came out last year. It's, it's free, you can watch it on dreamhampton.com. But I also have been making these small videos because I know that that is how people are digesting information. Um, in Detroit, um, we were dealing, first we were dealing with the murder of Ayanna Stanley Jones. Um, Ayanna Stanley Jones was a nine-year-old who was first set on fire and then shot in the head um, by the Detroit Police Department when they came into her house at 5 a.m. and she was sleeping on the couch with her grandmother looking for her uncle with an arrest warrant. They came in that heavy and quite frankly that theatrical because they had a television crew with them. I think it was 48 hours. Um, I was afraid that her story, unlike a lot of stories, I, I believe that Trayvon had happened after, before Amayana, um, that this was gonna be a story that we didn't care about, you know, and I wanted us to care about it. So I used my platform on social media. Back then I was like into Twitter. I'm not so much anymore. But I, I was using my platform to raise up this story about Ayanna Jones. When Renisha McBride happened, there had been a brother, what was the brother who played football for um, Tallahassee for FAMU? And he 
went looking for help. He was in a Virginia neighborhood, I think, or North Carolina. Joshua something. He was a football player, and he'd been in an accident, and he went looking for help in a neighborhood. And so he was very kind of, you know, he was a, it was a post-accident. So he was, he didn't have his, he was, you know, he wasn't, he had a head injury. And so he went to a white woman's door and asked for help. She called the police. The police arrived and shot him dead. And there was a lot of outrage on social media about that. And then a couple months later, Renisha McBride happened. And I did this thing, which I don't necessarily like to see when people do it. You know, I hate that I did it, but I said, I bet we're not going to have the same kind of, like, outrage around Renisha that we had for this brother Joshua. And then someone tweeted me back, like, well, you have so and so many followers. Why don't you say something about it. And I was like, oh yeah, true, <laughs> I do. And so I made this video, which is like a quick thing about a, a protest that we organized. Okay. So we'll show that now. Every life in our community is valued, whether you're in Detroit, whether you're in Dearborn, whether you're in Inkster, in particular as far as black life. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, here, here's a person who was in an accident and she's trying to seek help. It's a bullet in her head. I'm sick and tired of seeing black women murdered, raped, beaten, shot, and nobody's talking about it. I'm sick of the apathy. I'm sick of the apathy in the community. I'm sick of the apathy in the media, and it's, it, enough is enough. Where is this man? Who is he connected to? That's and right. why don't we know who he is? That's why right, is he not in there? That's if, I, right. if my child, 19, if, if my son was 19 and shot somebody, he would be under that jail. This is wrong. This is wrong, and everybody needs to be out here complaining about it. This young woman is dead. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. Dearborn is a city of restrictive covenants, right? This is a place that said, we prefer our own kind to live here, right? They had to take that to the Supreme Court. This is fertile ground for the new apartheid. Wayne County prosecutor, Kim Worthy, she needs to step in and talk to her. Call her out, call her out, call her out. U.S. Attorney Barbara McCoy at the federal level may need to investigate Everybody. Yeah. her civil rights being violated according to federal law. We need some justice here. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. Renisha McBride. Renisha McBride. Renisha McBride. Renisha McBride. Thank you. I'm sorry that we didn't um, check.
check the levels on that. That got loud. That's <laughs> me. My bad. <laughs> it's okay. That's on me. Do you want to go right into the next to the next one and talk about no, kind of the need narrative to set shifting? Up the let's, work that we're doing. let's do that. Yeah. So so we're talking about again this idea of narrative shifting. So we have Renisha McBride, mm -hmm. so that she's not forgotten. We yeah. know that there's kind of a, a again this thread of your work, but also a thread in looking at Claudette Colvin and and how it is that oftentimes many people LGBTQ, right. um, undocumented people of color, undocumented folks women oftentimes are pushed into the margins when we're talking about this idea of liberation or revolution or empowerment for black people, right? right. And so we looked at, uh, you introduced me to a video a little bit earlier today talking about all black people aren't going to be free until all black stories are told. Right. So this idea around the shifting of the narrative has a lot to do with the introduction of new narratives so that we're able to see what our whole what, what what the corpus of the black community and the marginalized and the oppressed and the flattened look like is that reasonable absolutely there are a couple things that come to mind real quickly i mean one is what a missed opportunity birth of a nation was i mean beyond nate parker's drama like what a missed opportunity it was to talk about instead of talking about the truth as we know it of nat turner which is that he was someone who believed he was talking to God, right? Um, I have an ex-boyfriend who thought that too. Like he, and, and he was diagnosed with being bipolar and um, severely schizophrenic, right? Um, and instead, instead of talking about like a mental health, looking at the Nat Turner thing from a, not only an empowerment, absolutely we have to look at slavery resistance and rebellions, but instead of that, he constructed this narrative, a very patriarchal fantasy around revenge, meaning that his woman was raped right. and that this whole narrative, this whole rebellion that Nat Turner led was based on, and patriarchy, the main provisions of patriarchy, right, are, I mean, the main tenets of patriarchy are that you provide and you protect, right? That is kind of the burden that patriarchy p places on men, all men. Um, and so instead of like looking at the truth of Nat Turner's life, which is that, and I'm not saying that mental illness isn't the right response to slavery. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that slavery drove many people insane, right? Um, there's nothing natural or humane about, or even human about being enslaved. So instead of looking at it from that lens, Nate Parker came with this patriarchal fantasy of revenge, right? Um, when I think about like some of the work that I'm doing right now, right? Um, one of the things I do is work around mass incarceration. So if you see John Legend at the Oscars talking about there are more people in jail now than there were slaves in the 19th century at the Oscars, that's because I worked with him on that speech. It's because I'm taking him around to prisons. He had read Michelle Alexander's book and he said to me, um, and I, I approached him about being a part of a campaign in California called Prop 47. I also live in California. And Prop 47 was a proposal that reclassified um, a number of felonies to misdemeanors. They should have always been misdemeanors. It was things like accepting stolen merchandise, possessing a small amount of drugs, writing bad checks. Those crimes in California had you in jail with people who were murderers and rapists. It was a felony. And so we had that reclassified to misdemeanors, which brought tens of thousands of people home and which expunged people's records. They no longer, when they went to apply for a job at Home Depot or wherever, get, apply for a home, they no longer had to write, check the felon box because now they were untethered from this status of felon. So that was this initiative we did prop, called Prop 47. When I asked John Legend to work on, with me on that, he had just finished Michelle Alexander's book. And he said, you know, I really want to make prisons an issue that I deal with. I've been thinking about schools a lot. I've been working on schools for the past 10 years. There's an obvious school to prison pipeline connection. And I want to make it my issue. And I was like, that's amazing, John Legend. <laughs> we welcome you into this work. But people have been doing this work for decades. So let's take a year where you're not in front of cameras, where you're not out here yapping, but where you are learning 
and listening to the people most affected by mass incarceration. So we took him to a men's prison. We took him to a juvenile prison. We took him to a jail in Austin. We took him to a women's prison in Washington State. And he got, and we took him to a forum of people who have been victims of crime. Um, we had him sit, sit down with prosecutors, with lawmakers. And, and in that way, and it was just a year, I mean, obviously this kind of education can take many years. And in that way, he got a real kind of like real talking points from the people who had been doing the work and who were most affected. Because we don't need celebrities out here saying any old thing. I mean, we learned that with Lil Wayne, right? Like nobody needs to ask Lil Wayne serious questions, you know? Um, having a platform and celebrity and visibility is only as useful, is only useful if you are actually connected to people doing the work and most affected, right? Another example would be Game and Snoop. We were doing all this work in, in LA, working with the sheriffs, making demands, and then Snoop and Game went and met with them, having met with none of the organizers and just said stupid, stupid things in the press conference with them, right? Right now in California, I'm working on a prop called Prop 64. And the next three videos I'm gonna show you are videos that I produce to shift the narrative around marijuana legalization. Um, and the reason that- But wait, <laughs> go on. No, and, and the reason he, we, the context for you saying when I was like, don't judge people, yeah. was David was complaining about one of his students coming to class smelling like weed, right? And this was a couple of years ago. And I was like, well, what's wrong with that? you know um and, and so we got into this conversation you know about again and i look at marijuana legalization in a in a couple with through a couple of lenses right um one we need actual scientists to talk about whether or not it does or does not do harm when i was in the ninth grade i was lucky enough to have a health teacher back when they used to have that as a class mm -hmm who said to me, I'm supposed to tell you, the Detroit public school system wants me to tell you that if you smoke marijuana, that they tested some mice and it made the mice, their, it made their testicles smaller. And I'm supposed to come in front of this classroom mm -hmm. and tell you that. He said, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe that I had a teacher who was kind of breaking the third wall in that way, right? So in that, in that really early example of narrative shifting, I got like, oh wow, there's this state agenda there's some science that may or may not support this state agenda. Mm -hmm. And then here's my teacher presenting both of these things to me. Um, so we look at marijuana legislation and the, and the prop is called Prop 64. It's on the ballot this Tuesday. In a couple ways, we look at it as a criminal justice issue. Um, and we look at it as an economic um, opportunity, equity issue, right? Michelle Alexander was recently, and she's the, I keep saying her name, but y'all know who she is, right? Okay, so she, she recently was quoted as saying that, you know, white men are poised in this moment to make billions of dollars off of marijuana when black men and women, she said black men, but it's true that black women participated in this industry too, have been locked away for this for generations. And when it becomes legal in a place like Colorado, and Colorado had a $50 million surplus from marijuana sales, which means that beyond what they thought they were gonna make from taxing marijuana, they made an additional $50 million. And because Colorado's a fairly sparsely populated state, everyone in the state was set to get a refund check of like 14 or $1,100. And they said, no, actually we wanna put this on the ballot and, and vote to have this money, this $50 million, not sent to us as individual taxpayers, but invested in the public school system. So that's what they're dealing with in Colorado. They just got too much money. They don't know what to do with it. Why? Because of marijuana, right? But in Colorado, there is a clause that says you can't work in a dispensary, you can't own a dispensary, you can't work in the marijuana industry if you have a felony, even if that felony was a nonviolent drug offense. So do you follow me? Like, you may be really good at selling drugs. And some of us got people in our family, that's the only thing they're good at, right? And I'm, listen, everyone's not going to be a physicist, a lecturer, a doctor, you know? I, I, there are people in my family who don't even speak good enough to work at Burger King, 
you know? Um, and so now they're saying, you can't work in this industry that we're making billions of dollars off because we're ending the prohibition on marijuana like they once ended the prohibition on alcohol. So in California, when it came time for us to pass this law, we made sure that that was removed, that there no longer is this clause, because we also believe that once you've served your time, even if it was a felony, that you shouldn't serve it in, per in per um, perpetuity. It shouldn't be an, a lifelong sentence. That one, If you do 20 years for a terrible crime, for me, rape is the worst crime, right? If you do 20 years for rape, that after those 20 years, that's the end of that sentence, that it shouldn't be something that you continue to pay for by not being able to vote, by not being able to access education, by not being able to access housing, right? So there's a, just a, a basic issue around don't have people having this felon status forever. Um, and there's this other issue of economic opportunity. What are we talking about with these jobs? Where are these magic jobs? When we start fighting for $15 an hour, what did Wendy's announce about six months ago? That they would cut their workforce by a third. So now you can tell an iPad if you want a pickle on your double. Because they, that's how they're going to respond to us demanding something closer to a living wage. Right? So I am really concerned about where, where people, my folks, are going to work. Right. And I'm not talking about people with degrees. I'm not even talking about people with high school degrees. I'm talking about the people I grew up with in Detroit. So, um, and then there's the criminal justice issue, which is that we are targeted, black and brown people. If a policeman wanted to actually make his quota for drug arrests every year, he could go into an Emory dorm right now and make his whole month's quota in an hour. But that's not what happens. What happens is that black and brown youth, and this is boys and girls and people on the gender spectrum, are engaged by the police, harassed by the police, targeted by the police for marijuana. So that in a state like Colorado, where you have $50 million surplus, you can go down four or five states to Louisiana and you can still get a life sentence, like this brother did, I can't remember his name, but he got, not a life sentence, but 27 years, and he himself was 27. So essentially a life sentence for having marijuana. So, so, so those kind of disparity in laws. So th these are the videos. We're going to start with Pusha T, yeah, right? Yeah. So Pusha T is the CEO of Good Music, which is the Kanye's California's label. Prop, sorry. And this is him. It's a short one. California's Prop 64 passes. No one will ever be incarcerated for marijuana again. Marijuana arrests are the engine that's driving the war on drugs. It's one of the number one reasons people trying to re-enter their communities are sent back to prison. I'm not a California voter, but I know when good legislation passes in the biggest state, other states follow. And that's an important step in ending mass incarceration around the country. What's most important to me is keeping people who are coming home, home. If ending prohibition on marijuana reduces recidivism, then let's do it. So Pusha, his issue is reentry and recidivism. He wants people who are coming home from prison um, to have access to all of the things that we're talking about, to be able to vote. Um, in his state where he's from, Virginia, that's not true. Felons can't vote. Um, he wants them to be able to access health, ha on jobs, health care, education. So his issue is reentry and recidivism. So when I came to him and said, Pusha, do you mind doing this video for Prop 64? He's like, well, I'm not really about marijuana legalization. I don't even smoke. And I was like, that's perfect because this isn't about people who just want to smoke. Do you know that the number one reason that people are violated from, on parole is for testing positive for marijuana? And he was like, wow, okay. You know, so then we got to this issue and he did that for me real quickly. The next video is an NBA. Um, he played in the NBA for 16 years. His name is Al Harrington. Um, and this is a video I made with him it's a one minute video. My name is Al Harrington and I played in the NBA for 16 seasons. When I was young, I definitely did not smoke. We always had that connotation that it was just bad for you. And then especially was illegal. You felt that you would go to jail, so I stayed as far away from it as I could. When I started using it after I got staph infection, someone introduced it to me and said, you should try this, it's for inflammation and for pain relief. So I tried it. Well, my grandmother is um, from Fayetteville, North Carolina. A super religious woman. She's a foundation of our family. My grandmother suffered from glaucoma, and she also has diabetes. 
When I first tried to introduce cannabis to my grandmother, she totally was against it. And she said, boy, you better get out of my face. So we talked for a while. She was still saying no, saying no. So finally I convinced her. And she said, you know what? You know, my eyes hurt so bad today, I'll try anything. So I had my boy go to the dispensary. We vaporized it for her. We had a smoke it. Came to check on her, I would say about 90 minutes later. And I opened the door and she was looking down. She was like, you know, I haven't been able to read the words of my Bible in over three years. I'm healed. My experience with my own pain, what it did for my grandmother, definitely made me take a deep look into the industry and I ended up investing in this space. Marijuana, I feel, has enhanced my life. I still wake up at six o'clock in the morning, I walk my dog, and then I go straight to the gym. I work out hard for two hours, then I go to my office and work for the rest of the day. I'm voting yes on Prop 64. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was coming for your parents and your pastors on that one. Um, <laughs> this last one, and Al Harrington, one of the things you missed, I'm sorry that the sound has been so uneven again, but one of the things that you missed was he said that after the experience he had with his grandmother, the experience he had with, it, with his own staph infection, he became an investor. So Al Harrington, um, I actually met him because I wanna be, not only do I wanna be working in the space of owning and operating and selling marijuana, right? Owning and operating dispensaries. Um, but I want more black folks to be in it. So I'm essentially like, we need more black drug dealers, right? Now that's an incredibly, I mean, how does that sound? Coming up to Morehouse King Chapel, like, hey y'all, we need more black, black drug dealers, right? Notice, um, notice how I'm <laughs> conveniently not on stage when you say that. Um, so, Al Harrington is one, there aren't many black people in this space. Like I said, it's a multi-billion dollar space and we are criminally absent from it. And he's one of the people who actually is doing really well in the space. Um, he invested a lot of his MBA earnings. He has a company that he named after his grandmother. The third video I'm gonna show you is from someone who has a lot of experience as a drug dealer. And you might know him as Beyonce's husband. His name is Jay-Z. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the US blew up. Today we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough on crime laws and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the US prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana are still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed despite a booming and celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry. 
most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared the so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. I really wanted to take questions, but it looks like we don't have time. But I guess, I mean, in terms of what does this mean of Black Lives Matter, what does it mean for us to advocate for those who've been criminalized, which A, is all of us, but those who may have been committing so-called crimes? What does it mean to center the, the drug user, the drug addict, the drug seller? And this question can be applied to anyone what is, or at, the mo at the margins of our movement. What does it mean to center the trans sex worker as a labor issue? What does it mean to say that I believe that trans sex workers should have health care? Um, when we begin to address those questions that are really hard, that aren't about those of us who present well, who don't smell like weed when they come to class, who um, are poised to benefit, you know, in this society as is. When we begin to center the ve the most vulnerable of us, and usually when we think of the most vulnerable, we think of children because that's an easy easier narrative. We think that children are innocent, but what if we were to think of the people that we think of as guilty, and center them in our movement? Then we are truly transforming not just the narrative, but the the boundaries of our struggle and then we can all be free when all black people are free thank you thank you so so we'll do this uh, I, I know one of the things that we did want to do is we did want to make sure that we had an opportunity to to ask and, and to share questions so dream will be here for a little bit and you can come up and ask her questions individually but one of the other things that we are doing at one o'clock at one o'clock we're going to open up uh, a class so Dansby 200 at one o'clock, Dream will be in there. We'll be having conversation a, a lot like this. We've invited students from Spelman and CAU to be in that space so that we can kind of deconstruct this a little bit more. But but let me just say, Dream, I love you so much. Thank you for being here. And um, and one thing we'll do before we end is we'll do we'll sing Dear Old Morehouse, and then you guys can can be out. Okay, so we'll do it acapella style. <laughs> 